Hello and welcome to Girls Empowered. My name is Naomi. My name is Desharnet and we are your hosts today. Girls Empowered is a show aimed to create conversations about women's daily struggles living in a male-dominated society. Today we'll be talking about reproductive justice. So, did you hear about the Women's March in Washington? Yes, wasn't it in January? Yes! <laughs> The Women's March was a demonstration that gathered women and activists to advocate for women's rights under the Trump administration. Actually, I heard it was the largest single-day demonstration in the United States. Reproductive rights was a big issue at the march. Do you know what reproductive rights are? It was one of the most advocated for. So, why is this such a hot topic? Well, with the inauguration of President Trump, many policy changes will be taking place that will limit women's access to abortions and reproductive health care. Isn't that a violation of someone's reproductive rights? In fact, it is. It gives you the right to legal and safe abortions, birth control, freedom from forced sterilization and contraception, also the right to access reproductive health care and the right to education in order to make free and informed decisions concerning your body. One of Trump's first executive orders was to defund Planned Parenthood, where reproductive health care services are accessible to women. His administration has also stopped funding to organizations that perform abortions or even discuss them. Let's jump to this video of Loretta Ross, a feminist organizer and women's rights activist who shares her story of reproductive justice and how these policies can affect women. I was a nerd as a kid, inclined towards science and math. I actually majored in chemistry but I came from a very conservative family. I didn't learn anything about sex and sexuality at all, except what the Bible preached. I had an older cousin who committed incest against me, and I became pregnant. I was only 14. This was pre-Roe v. Wade. I had very few choices at that time, and all of a sudden, I became a mother. And then, in an attempt to prevent future pregnancies, I accepted implantation of the Dalcon Shield, which was an IUD uh, made by A.H. Robbins that ended up sterilizing 700,000 women around the world, and I was one of them. I went into a coma one night, got rushed to the hospital. They had to do a hysterectomy to save my life. I was like 23 years old. And so finally, I just got really pissed off and <laughs> just said, this isn't right. I freaked out because as far as I knew in the African-American community, we were still calling abortion the A word. I'd had a number of conversations with black women's organizations who were totally convinced that this was a white women's issue. So I told the story of my abortion and then all of a sudden we're in conversation about when other women had abortions. Tell your truth and you'll get amazing results and responses. In the 1980s and 1990s, women started organizing in Native American communities, Latina communities, Asian Pacific Islander communities, and the African American communities. This explosion of organizing really gave rise to what we call the reproductive justice movement today. One of the things that we had to challenge the pro-choice movement on was a singular focus on abortion. It's about abortion, but it's not just about abortion. Because we are women of color that come from communities always subjected to population control schemes, we fight equally hard for the right to have our children. And we have to fight for the right to raise our children that we have in safe and healthy environments. It's a human rights way of looking at the totality of women's life. And I really like to think that it's shifted the thinking even in the broader pro-choice movement. I was overwhelmed. First of all, 1.15 million people came. That was the largest protest in U.S. history. The number of women of color who showed up just astonished me. But 
keeps me going in this work is that I've always had to play the hand that life dealt me. I'm engaged because I still have that son that I had 40-something years ago. And what I get the most energy from is young people who get it. So what are your reactions based on the video that we just saw? Well, it just shows that, like, as a woman, you can really overcome any obstacles that prevent you from getting to where you want to be. And just, like, listening and listening to her story and stuff like that, it just really inspired me. I think it inspired other women, too, because at the same time, like, there were, she wasn't, like, the only one. There mm -hmm. were other women who, who were in her shoes, and they all, like, made, they all made a movement to have their voices heard. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And, you know, like, it just goes to show that even back in the day, in their time, youth weren't educated about sex or human sexuality at all. Right, I agree. We want to continue the conversation of reproductive justice. So stay tuned as we interview two organizations and get their input. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to tune into our discussion today of reproductive justice. Today we are joined by a panel of three organizations, two pro-life and one pro-choice, uh, who have come to educate us and give us further insights. How is everyone doing today? Great, Pretty thank good. you. Wow. Fantastic. Once again, I thank you all for coming to talk about this very sensitive topic. Reproductive justice is meant when people have the power and resources to make healthy decisions about their bodies, sexuality, and reproduction. In this conversation today, we wanna focus specifically on the issue of abortion. I would like to start off by introducing our guest. To my right, we have Chris Lattery, and he's president of Expectant Mother Care. Their mission is to serve thousands of distraught expectant moms in offices located in the four boroughs and on the streets at abortion sites in the New York City area. They offer resources such as consultations, ultrasounds, and referrals for prenatal care and other assistance. To my left, we have Ifoma Anunkor. Uh, she's the director of Young Adult Initiative called Expect, and the Human Life Review is a journal that have devoted to life issues, primarily abortion, as well as other resources such as genetic engineering, cloning, and fetal tissue experimentation. Through their publications, they deal with more general questions of family and society, such as the abortion mentality. And to my left, we have Aisha, and she's from Reproductive Health Access Project and she's also a family medicine doctor. The Reproductive Health Access Project is a national organization that works directly with primary care providers, helping them integrate abortion, contraception, and miscarriage management into their practices. So I'd like to start off by asking each of you to tell us a little bit about your organization and what role do you think it plays regarding reproductive justice? I can go ahead and mm -hmm. start. <laughs> um, so the Reproductive Health Access Project has been around for a while in New York, and we have different clusters throughout mm -hmm. the United States. Um, and our mission is really to support healthcare providers in the areas of abortion, contraception, and miscarriage. Um, and we do that through various different avenues. So we educate students, we train other family medicine doctors um, so that they have those skills, and we train nurse practitioners and other practitioners as well. Um, we also provide over-the-phone support for people as well. Um, our, and that's kind of at the core of our values, so really to lift up women from all different backgrounds, um, to focus on women who are underrepresented and underserved in the communities, and to help them make the decision about you know their either pregnancies or what they want their families to look like in their futures. Okay. <coughs> so uh, I work with the Human Life Review, and it started over 40 years ago wow. in response to a case called Roe versus Wade, which um, legalized abortion in yeah. the United States and protected abortion, uh, particularly before viability, which is, mm -hmm. I guess, when um, a baby can exist outside of the womb um, uh, if it were to be born for some reason at that point. So um, basically, a lot of people intuitively believe, okay, when someone's pregnant, 
It's a human life inside her, inside her. Mm -hmm. So for, it, it feels wrong to either pressure her or because of hard circumstances for her to have to choose to kill her baby. And they see it as killing a baby in the womb, but they can't articulate it well, or they don't understand what's happening in politics and medicine and science and how all that, how you're able to articulate being pro-life in all of those fields. And so the Human Life Review brings together scientists, lawyers, uh, politicians, um, and then regular family members, regular husbands, wives, um, women especially, oh. to write and articulate um, what's going on in their culture and um, in their perspective fields and how to defend life in them. Well, when I was in my early 20s, um, uh, many years ago, I discovered that New York City was nicknamed the abortion capital of America mm -hmm. and that annually in the 1980s when I was uh, getting interested in the topic there were literally 110,000 abortions being performed per year in the five boroughs. Now um, it's about 70,000 a year but the rate of abortion here is still double the national average. So more than one out of three babies that are not miscarried end up aborted in the five boroughs. And in the Bronx, for most of the last 40 plus years, close to half of uh, all pregnancies that didn't miscarry ended in an abortion, which is tragic. In some neighborhoods in Brooklyn, African American uh, rate of abortion is 60% or higher. For the last 40 years, more black babies have been aborted than born. To me, that's tragic. I don't call that reproductive justice. No way, no how. To me, there's no justice in abortion for the child. Uh, uh, you know, the term reproductive justice to a pro-lifer is a very strange expression that does not really reflect, reflect reality. When you abort five million children in a city in 47 years, I don't call that reproduction. I call that population extermination, not reproduction, and I don't call it just. Five million children that could have literally revolutionized the world uh, have been exterminated legally and, th and hundreds of women have died in the process in legal abortion and uh, many have been maimed or sterilized for life and we have put some abortion doctors from this city in jail and uh, you know I could go on. Okay. So I'd like to kick off the conversation with our first question. Um, from your experience what role do you think race plays when it comes to access to health services including abortion? Anyone? I can start. I think sure. um, race plays a huge role, and it also depends on what kind of reproductive health care a woman is trying to get. So my passion is um, <coughs> reproductive health for women of color, black women in particular, like myself, um, who are um, from raised in low-income household or um <coughs> from Harlem. Mm -hmm. and the inner city and when I think Chris had alluded to this but um, the abortion rates for black women in Harlem is about 54 percent so even in Harlem there are more abortions than births for black women so we don't have um, an abortion problem like there's not we use that service more than mm -hmm. anyone else but the inf the maternal mortality rate for black women it's 12 times that for as um, compared to white women. So between 2006 and 2010, less than five white women died dur um, um, through the pregnancy process and childbirth. But 56, over 56 black women died around that same time. So uh, we don't have 
good access when we want to be mothers. And you know, there's a whole, I think it's, I see it everywhere in the culture, in the medical field, when, it's, when we want to be moms and do what our bodies naturally do, uh, we don't have the support and we don't have the resources and we're not given the proper care. So I think um, that's where I'm seeing a lot of the disparity. We also have the highest infant mortality rates. In Mississippi, um, uh, the rate of mor uh, mortality, uh, maternal mortality is compared to third world countries in sub-Saharan Africa. So we have a lot of work to do to focus reproductive justice. I, loved, I would love, I love to claim that word too, but I think it should really then encompass, um, for me it would not include abortion, but it would also focus on um, the injustice um, and the, how unsafe it is. For, for it shouldn't be unsafe to be pregnant and to have a child. Uh, so we need to address that. It's considered a crisis actually, even internationally. Amnesty International did a report on um, saying, you know, this is a, it's a crisis, calling it a crisis. And so I'm surprised at li the little attention it's getting, even from those who claim to be on the forefront of reproductive justice movement, um, to really almost ignore this um, and focus so much on abortion, which is too high in, in, in black populations. So I would agree with what some of, um, some of what you said. Um, there definitely, when it comes to black versus white, as far as maternal mortality, so women dying during childbirth, it is much higher in black populations. Um, for general health care, I'm a family physician. Um, we have a higher rate, black people have a higher rate of hypertension, of diabetes, of a lot of other medical problems. So it's not just in reproductive health, it's actually throughout all types of health um, that people of color have a higher rate and are disproportionately affected. Um, when it comes to abortion, um, so reproductive justice means that we include everything that has to do with reproduction. Um, so that includes the right to parent a child, the right to have a child and adopt, the right to have an abortion, the right for contraception. All of those things are really included in the word reproductive justice. And so really um, when we talk about that, reproductive justice is focusing on race because there are so many disparities. Um, one example that I will give you is when we look at the rate of unintended pregnancies, um, for women of color and also women who are below the poverty line, so very poor women. Women who are below the poverty line have a very high rate of unintended pregnancies when you compare them with people who are over the poverty line, so wealthier women. But when you actually put women, um, black women, Hispanic women, and white women together, even those women who are at the highest income the black women still have a higher rate of unintentional pregnancy. So that means that it's not just about being poor, that there is something that has to do with race. And we know this in every aspect of medicine. Wow. So well, I'd like to point out that uh, one, of the, one of the observations I've made about uh, racial differences is in the black community, uh, there's been an utter collapse in the custom of getting married. Uh, there is an extremely small percentage of black couples that marry today. And it's getting higher amongst uh, Hispanics and whites too. But the poverty that comes with single motherhood and attempting to raise a family without a father and an income from the father affects a lot of the decisions that uh, that young women make and I think this is something that society needs to focus on rebuilding is the value of of raising children in a married household and it's it's complex and it's uh, it's something that the government isn't uh, best suited to fix okay uh, and we tend to look at uh, government f to solve all our problems. But I think in this area, the churches have to do a, a heck of a lot more, uh, the religious community, to restore the, the value of marriage so that uh, there are, and the value of abstinence. I mean, let's face it, the uh, 
vast majority of black women uh, and mothers we see in our pregnancy centers are single women engaging in sex and who have no deep or strong relationship with the father of the child who as soon as a baby comes uh, they want to get rid of the guy and end the baby in the same process because the man has no commitment to the woman there's no concept of them getting married and this leads to uh, high unplanned pregnancies and the incredibly high abortion rate here in the city of New York. I don't think the uh, government officials and our clergy in our city uh, take this issue on seriously. You never hear the major media talk about abortion as a crisis in the city of New York. The fact that we've aborted five million children, that there are more black babies aborted every year than are born. I mean, the pro-choice side doesn't seem to care less. They want more abortion, more, quote, access. But we have more abortion clinics in this city than any city in the Western world. We have more hospitals than any other major city in the U.S. So there's no issue about, quote, access. You can, you can get, there are more abortion facilities per square mile in this city and more hospitals than anywhere else. Maybe that's why we have such a high rate of abortion, because we have too much access to abortion. People can cavalierly get an abortion, can casually get an abortion, can get it for free, whether they're a citizen or not. So, I mean, the idea that there's not enough access in this city to abortion, when sadly we abort so many of our future citizens, you know, when you look at it, our population is pretty much the same as it was 40, 50 years ago. It was 8 million in the 60s. And it's now still about 8 million. Yeah, it's slightly climbing, but we've killed our future to a large degree here. Uh, I don't see a problem with access. The, ac the issues are different for me. I'd like to move on to the question about what options there would be for women who lack health insurance or especially access to know about reproductive justice. So what kind of alternatives would you say there are for people who don't have health care? So uh, um, New York, I think, actually does a really wonderful job of providing access to health care to their population. Um, and abortion is actually included in that. Um, and so with that, it actually doesn't take that much to be able to sign up for pregnancy services. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're pregnant and you don't have insurance to be covered for that, um, and you want to continue your pregnancy to be covered for that. If you're pregnant and you do not want to continue your, your pregnancy and you'd like to have an abortion to be covered for that. Um, so I think that we're actually really lucky here and there are other states that do that as well. Um, so I do think that there still are a lot of access issues for women um, when they're looking for either continuing their pregnancy and they need prenatal care um, or having an abortion. But I do think that in New York, we're actually fairly lucky and that most women are covered for that. Um, you can actually also pay out of pocket for abortions in New York and many other states. Um, but for women who are poor, that is a huge issue. Um, and so it's really very preventative in letting women have the families that they choose. Okay. About 3,000 women come into our offices per year. And I'd say about 2,000 of those three do not have insurance. What's amazing is how, unfortunately, lazy people are about not applying for insurance when they're healthy. Mm -hmm. And of course, uniquely for women, if they're sexually active and they haven't um, gone through the process of getting insurance in advance, they panic when they get pregnant and they don't know whether they're eligible for insurance, they have never gone for insurance, especially, you know, recent high school grads uh, or non-college young 20s millennials, 
they're healthy, they're not worried, maybe they're not working, so they don't get insurance with their job. It's difficult to get Medicaid when you're not pregnant because you have to just be at poverty level. But as Alicia said, the very generous benefits in New York, and in fact, undocumented women have access to Medicaid when they're pregnant. Not when they're not pregnant, but when they're pregnant. Mm. So they can get prenatal care or they can get an abortion. But a lot of the, a lot of young women just are not aware of the availability of insurance that's out there. Um, and it's a very difficult world. The world of insurance is very confusing and very difficult mm -hmm. as well to navigate. Yeah, and, w and one, of the, one of the big services pro-life centers perform, and like ours, uh, and we've been doing this work for 32 years here in New York City, counseled over 150,000 women, is, is you know getting them access to insurance coverage. You know, for a woman that comes to us who's considering an abortion, we'll help her get insurance coverage. How would you Even go about though that? we want her to not get an abortion, but we know she needs it if she's going to choose to carry it later on anyway. If she changes her mind, she needs it either way. She actually needs it more because the cost of prenatal care and delivery is far more than for an abortion. So how would you go about provide, like helping her gain access to health insurance? I think the city has to do more to um, advertise the availability of, in, of the insurance programs that are out there. Okay. I have a, one, uh, just want to jump in mm -hmm. and add a, um, <coughs> a comment to this as well. Yes, women um, have great access to health care if they're low income, but again, the quality of health care is, is questionable. Um, considering um, the infant mortality rates as well. Um, we, uh, low income women have higher in infant mortality rates. Black women have the highest maternal mortality rates. And um, I remember looking online um, and there would be reviews on abortion clinics. And some women are like, don't go here, it's, it's gross, it's nasty. Don't go here, it's, it's, you know, it's so dirty. They, were, they did this and, and uh, nail salons get more inspections um, get inspected more than um, than abortion clinics do. Um, so then the, there are lots of stories out there. Um, I know Chris had mentioned uh, a couple of abortionists or a few abortionists throughout the years that have been imprisoned. A lot of times, um, the quality of care, even in abortion procedure, is not good. It's free for them, but. Um, because they're women of color and because they're low income, they're not given the best quality of care. And uh, there was a woman who died during an abortion. There are many who, I mean, many is a you know, point of view many. Yeah. For me, I think one is, one is too many. But um, first of all, there's countless amount of, amounts of women who have injuries from abortions. But because you don't go back to the abortion clinic, maybe two, three days later, two weeks later, you go to a regular hospital. They might not connect the dots between whatever injuries you're having then and the abortion that you had last month or two weeks ago and you just tried to stick it out. So uh, Cree er Irwin, she was uh, a resident in Michigan and she had an abortion last summer. A few days later, she died in her, in her, in her mom's home. And autopsy is supposed to be three weeks, uh, but Michigan, in, in general in Michigan, and instead it took six to seven months and they just released the autopsy, delete, um, uh, redacting certain parts of it, you know, where they put like a black thick line along it so you don't see certain information, uh, but they had to conclude that she died from the abortion. And it was an abortion at Planned Parenthood. I don't know why it would take six to seven months to put this information out there. Um, so I do think the poor quality of healthcare, it gets underreported, uh, and that's something to look into. Um, I just wanted to clarify a few points. So abortion clinics do get inspected um, because a lot of abortion clinics are actually federally qualified health centers. So the federal government actually does come in um, and they do make sure that everything's routine. So giving the medications for abortion, just like giving medications for other things. Um, and the other thing is abortions are actually really safe. Um, way less, so it's 
0.3 in 100,000 women will die from an abortion in the first trimester, which is what the majority, where the majority of abortions are performed. Um, so that's actually the majority are eight weeks and under. The first trimester is 12 weeks and under. Um, so they're actually incredibly safe. It's safer than getting in the car and driving here to the studio. It's safer, much safer than childbirth, and it's one of the safest procedures that we have in every single, for every single medical condition that we have in the medical community. And yeah. if I can <laughs> resolve that, because that's a great point. Don't worry. It's, I think, to her point, I think it's sad that abortion should be safer than childbirth, one. And also, I think certain side has something to gain by saying, you know, abortions are, are safe, particularly people who make money off of them, like um, Planned Parenthood and institutions connected with them, like Guttmacher Institute, which puts a lot of this information out there about stats and safety and all of that. Uh, but a lot of people, even regular doctors, but they've been shunned by the pro-choice side and pro-choice institutions and only pro-life institutions publish their work and give them, you know, a, a, a space to say this, but um, abortion does have a lot of negative effects. It, um, it has, it increases risks of ectopic pregnancies, which are, and miscarriages, and it increases risks for breast cancer. Um, so there are websites like um, abortionchangesyou.com, and women who have had abortions talk about the emotional and the mental um, devastation it has been for them. Now, um, again, it's not, this is stuff people don't want to talk about or they deny it, but you, you deny it in the sense of like, we don't agree, but it has not, these, um, the, the, such research has not been refuted and organizations continue to put them out and it doesn't get the uh, media attention that it deserves and so a lot of women are not aware of the risks that come with abortion. I'd like to uh, make a few points um, to refute what you said about the inspections in New York uh, because they're federally inspected. First of all, most of the abortion facilities in that do the abortions in New York City are not licensed clinics. They're doctor's offices. And they don't have uh, any uh, regular inspection protocol unless there's a complaint filed against the physician that operates the facility. The New York Post reported a few years ago, and I'm quoting from uh, an article from 2015. The New York Post reported last year that eight of New York's 25 abortion clinics had not been inspected at all between 2000 and 2012. A 12-year period of no inspections for eight abortion facilities, none in 12 years. And then five other others were inspected only once in a dozen years. Um, the New York State Health Department released that data in response to a lawsuit because they wouldn't freely give up the fact that there hadn't been a lot of inspections. There's a new book out called Gosnell in a movie later this year which chronicled a pattern in the state of Pennsylvania where the governor, who was a Republican, banned the health department from inspecting abortion clinics for 17 years. And a, a serial killer named Kermit Gosnell, who ran a house of horrors, who was only raided because he got into illegal drug sales, and they found a horror story there. Check out the book, Gosnell, and the movie that will come out. I've seen it. It's incredible how this mass murderer would snip the spine of living, born alive babies by the hundreds. They only prosecuted him for a handful and for the negligent care of a, a woman in his care who they charged him with and convicted him of murder. He has a life sentence in prison. So when you say that these abortion clinics are inspected regularly, check the articles on the history of this state. This state has been controlled by Democrats so you find there are Democrats and Republicans who are political who don't want these places inspected. So they, they and, and I also dispute your claim that abortion is completely safe. We could do a three-hour program on those issues, but you probably want to get on to some other questions. 
Um, President Trump stated in reference to Planned Parenthood that it is like an abortion factory, which is terrible. So how would you react to that statement that he made? It's true. Uh, actually, Planned Parenthood has, uh, by their own records, uh, the last year performed <coughs> something close to 334,000 abortions. I'm sorry, and I wait. So was your question about Planned Parenthood, or was it about how the Trump administration will affect Planned Parenthood and their care? Um, I was asking about Planned Parenthood. Okay. Um, okay. So I want to know what do you think is being, how, what education ties into reproductive justice and how it's being, how, how effectively it's being done to educate women about their rights? Um, I can take that one. So I don't think we're doing a wonderful job. I really wish that the woman from the Department of Health was here. Um, the Department Health is of Health in New York is actually not neutral. Um, they actually do support choice um, and they do support abortion. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that she would have done a really good job to speak to the education. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I've been involved with in the Department of Health is they actually just released this really wonderful sexual and reproductive justice video. Um, it's a three minute video. Oh, yes, it's have seen you seen it? it? Yeah. It's really it's really wonderful. Um, and so they're really trying to disseminate that to all of the health clinics and other areas so that women, um, women, men, everyone are aware um, of what New York provides when it comes to reproductive justice. Um, there are a lot of also on the ground reproductive justice groups. So the medical community, um, we're actually not the best ones to talk about reproductive justice because there have been groups in the community, hundreds of groups in the community in New York um, who have been doing this for a very long time, starting probably in the 70s but, or before then, but definitely um, really started gaining way in the 1980s and the 1990s. Um, so I think that there's, we've come a very long way in educating women, um, but I think education um, about the facts of reproductive health are still very much lacking, and we need to do a better job. I need to do a better job in the medical community, um, but we all need to do a better job about educating women. You know what I think is the irony is New York City holds itself up as the, uh, the beacon of enlightenment on sex education and contraception, okay? You can't get in as an abstinence-only education organization, and I knew one of the best in the country was based in Yonkers, New York. They were absolutely shut out of trying to reach the million uh, school students in New York City in the public school system, which I know a lot about because my wife has taught in it for 20 years. And, you know, it's all condomania. It's, it's contraceptive on, on steroids. And we, we teach our kids to have sex from the earliest age, uh, to experiment with, you know, all kinds of deviant behavior. And look, look at the results we get. We get one, of our th one out of three of our children are killed by their mothers annually. 10% of our mothers who get abortions are on their seventh or eighth abortion. Abortion is birth control in this city. That is what's taught in our school system and by our Department of Health, and it's horrific. <coughs> uh, speaking, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry, I want to I say something quickly. But um, um, there are a few um, organizations that try to help women uh, with natural forms of birth control. And not just that, but also like understanding how their uh, reproductive, their reproduction works and, mm -hmm. and um, um, the physiology of the ovulatory cycle. Uh, woman's cycle, cyclical hormonal activity and the link between your hormones and your health. And a lot of times what the pill does is it kind of just masks whatever you're, I mean, you'd probably be better at explaining this, but um, it, you don't, you, you lose touch of how your body's actually would, would be working. And if for a woman, your hormonal cycle and your, your ovulation cycle is almost very central to your health. And it, it, it can, um, reflect a lot of other health problems or uh, um, uh, symptoms you could be having that would be helpful to know. And so being able to encourage, there's a one program called FEM program, and there are um, great and 
NGOs. Um, and we do need NGOs and nonprofits now to try to go into communities to educate because these kinds of um, educational tools are not accepted um, or invited into the public school system. And it's a way to say, okay, before you pick up um, synthetic pills and, and, and drugs, how, can, how does your body naturally work? How are you looking into natural forms of birth control? Because uh, birth control pills have been linked to depression in teenagers. I'm sure this information was probably already out there. Finally, Teen Vogue, you, you know, a secular pro probably pro-choice magazine said, yeah, there's a link between teenage girls being depressed and being on the pill. Um, uh, you know, there are other, other effects of birth control that are probably controversial. A lot of birth control pills are also abortifacients, which means they actually do abort pregnancies very early on in pregnancy. So giving women an opportunity to look into something other than um, being on uh, synthetic drugs, I think, is would be great. Can I just say one thing? Is that okay? Sure. <laughs> exactly. Um, so it's true that birth control, hormonal forms of birth control, do alter your cycle. Um, some of them work by suppressing ovulation um, so that you don't release an egg. Um, but that actually happens when you're pregnant as well. So when women have back-to-back -back pregnancies, they also, their cycles are being suppressed in the same way. Um, and that is what's occurring through all, we'll say 10, nine to 10 months of pregnancy. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to correct you on is um, there are no forms of birth control that are abortions. Like I said, they prevent ovulation, which means that you can't even release an egg, so the egg can't be fertilized at all. Um, so there is no pregnancy that takes place with I know, hormonal birth I know controls. there are studies that have just came out recently, within the last few months. Particularly yeah. a lot of the, um, there have been some aborted, there are some contraceptions that are illegal in the U.S. that are the U.S. is exporting to third world countries. They also act as abortifacients, um, and um, I, I wouldn't say it if I if I didn't um, if I didn't see it. But that's that's interesting um, that that's an argument. But um, yeah. from the medical community's perspective, that's not. So I want to ask: We're in the era of Trump, as you all know. So what does this era of Trump? What does the era of Trump administration mean for women, and what can be done to counteract their threats to reproductive justice? Hmm. So. I think one thing that's been talked about a lot is what's going to happen with Medicaid and we've all talked about how Medicaid supports women. Maybe we disagree on the ways that it supports women, um, but prenatal care is on there. Um, so we're looking at a potential cut of Medicaid services in 2020, which would be a huge blow to women, um, of course. poor women, women of color huge, huge blow. And that doesn't mean taking away contraception from them or taking away abortion from them. It also means taking away prenatal care from them. Um, so I think that we as women are um, hugely at risk under this administration. Um, New York, again, is a wonderful place in that they are fighting back against that. There's something called the Complex Contraceptive Care Act and the Reproductive Health Act, and Cuomo is behind, Governor Cuomo is behind both of these things um, that basically keep in place, um, for example, free contraception. Um, so hold that over from the Affordable Care Act that we have now. Um, free contraception for everyone would also keep in place all of the abortion legislation from Roe v. Wade so that women can obtain safe and legal abortions in New York State. Uh, first of all, it's under Governor Cuomo that we've seen the abortion clinics go uninspected. So please don't give me the line about safe uh, reproductive care when uh, the Democrats have controlled our state for f completely for 50 years, choose to look the other way when abortion doctors have falls from grace, like killing a few women, maiming them for life. Uh, you know, the fact is, ab abortion's completely political in the state of New York. When you don't inspect the majority of abortion clinics for years, that's all political. That's because it's just a farce that there's concern and care for women. We inspect as if Alma uh, mentioned before, nail salons, uh, tanning salons, uh, barber shops, more than we do places where women uh, get all these so-called safe procedures. This is why this Dr. Gosnell, 
went uninspected completely for 17 years where he routinely snipped the necks of living babies by the, by the hundreds over 30 years. And he had disparate, you want to talk about disparate by race? He had a special floor for the white women uh, that was clean and well decorated. And for the, the rest of the blacks and Hispanics, he had a, a lower care of floor. He was black himself. And he, <laughs> he was himself a racist and uh, a mass murderer. And that's why he's spending the rest of his life in prison. He had people who weren't even high school graduates administering drugs in an abortion clinic that went on for 30 years. I think what I heard you say, though, initially was taking the topic of abortion out of politics. And I'm going to agree with you on that. I think that, again, we need to trust women. This is a decision that should be made between a woman or family, whoever they want to involve, and their doctors. But we're talking about politicians politics. here. And this is the, a loaded question against President Trump. Uh, the fact is that our, and Governor Cuomo, you're praising him. He's not to be praised. He's a disgrace. He wants to expand abortion up till birth without even being performed by doctors. He wants to lower the standards of health care for women by removing the requirement that abortions be performed by medical uh, licensed physicians. He wants to have nurses uh, at perform abortions. And maybe he'll even drop that requirement. And you say that's safe and that's an advancement for women's health? I don't think so. I'm sorry, I wanna ask, um, uh, half of roughly 1.2 million US women who have abortions each year are 25 or older. About 70% are teens. What do you think this number, do you think this number would increase if they do not have access to healthcare services? 100%, I'll just say that, because I know we're running out of time. <laughs> so yes, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, first of all, are you, are you suggesting that the government run the abortion clinics? Because, look, the, the fact is that it's mostly private operations that operate abortion clinics, and they've been on the, on the vast decline. I think if you just remove um, uh, access to contraception mm -hmm. for teens, then I think you would see an increase in, in pregnancies because pregnancy is a natural consequence of sexual activity. It's, and I, I, I put emphasis on natural um, because I feel like because these drugs are so readily available, it's becoming unnatural for a sexually active teen to be pregnant. We look at her and we, society shames her. Of course. Um, and so as a feminist, I see a lot of pregnancy shaming in urban America. You know, if you don't have a job and if you're not supporting yourself and living in a nice apartment, what are you doing pregnant? Even from Democrats. In fact, it's one of the old pres presidents of Planned Parenthood said, I know, and she said this to her constituents, you know, I know you're thinking, do we really want to, part of the reason why we have abortions is because as liberals, we're like, do we really want to be paying for all these babies? You know, so um, on the one hand, yes, it would, there would be an increase. But on the other hand, I, as a feminist, someone who cares about the youth and is pro-life, I don't just want to remove something and then not replace it. You know, so I think replacing that with education on mm. abstinence or even just waiting, the importance of knowing, uh, you know, being careful, um, natural forms of birth control, and um, I want to ask, Yeah, when you say natural forms of birth control, what kind? Oh. So there are, several, um, pro there are several programs that teach natural forms of birth control. And they're known to be between 88% and 93% effective. And some people might say, oh, 88%, that's not effective enough. But something I think, I don't know if Chris, I think Chris touched on this before, birth control is harder to follow and therefore you would more like be more likely to get pregnant on birth control than you would some of these natural, um, con um, natural birth forms of birth control mm. method. Women have found it life-changing, it's very new, but there are other ones that are out there um, and they're effective. Yeah, natural family planning basically means a couple of things. It means timing your cycles. Mm -hmm. um, it means also checking your cervical mucus. So actually like feeling your cervical mucus to see what the thickness is at different times of the month because that indicates when you're ovulating and when you're 
least likely and most likely to get pregnant. It also means taking your temperature at the same time every day. So it's actually pretty involved, but I think, I don't disagree with you on um, natural family planning, I think, and or on shaming of women or of teenagers who become pregnant, but I think really like what I'm trying to hone in on is that we need to provide all of the options for women um, and let them make that own decision for themselves. We really have to trust women with the information that we provide, the accurate information that we provide, because not everyone necessarily cares about getting pregnant. So maybe taking a pill every day and if they forget and they accidentally get pregnant, that's fine for them. They can you know, have a baby or they can have an abortion and that's okay. Um, but there are so many different kinds of birth control out there um, and natural family planning you can put in there as well. Um, withdrawal method, that's another one. Vasectomy, that's another one. But there are so many different kinds of birth control um, that I really think it's all about providing that choice for women and trusting them to make the best decision for themselves. I don't know how your organization will determine what stage of pregnancy an abortion should be done. Yeah, so um, that's a really good question and it's a very tricky question. So as I mentioned before, most abortions, the vast majority of abortions actually occur eight weeks or under, um, where there is no such thing as fetal pain. Um, much, well, all of the evidence that we have, we think that maybe somewhere around 24 weeks, the neuropathways, meaning the neurons that connect, the nerves that connect, um, begin to form. So it's probably even after that. Um, as far as deciding up to what we call a gestation, how many mm -hmm. weeks you provide an abortion, it's really an individual choice for an individual doctor to make. Some people feel more comfortable for one reason or another going further along. Some people aren't even trained to go further along. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's just I pain. Uh, you're, you're basically advocating women should have the right for 20 weeks after we know that uh, children can feel pain. For we 20, from 20 to 40 we weeks, we they should be able to abort their and child. And all of the evidence in the medical community, if anything exists, it's at 24 so weeks. So the legislators so that's why in how many states That's why mention? the laws are the way that they are. That's more to do with politics ah, than it is with okay, scientific so evidence. I think, you know, you and I are obviously going to differ on when a life begins. That's not something that I'm even going to try to even go there with you because I know we're going to differ on that. Um, I think... Again, we use medical evidence and we base our decisions on that medical evidence and then we provide that medical evidence to women and we let women, we trust women and we let women make their own decisions. On out the window too. Mm -hmm. wow. Okay, well I'd like to thank all three of you for joining us here at Girls Empowered, for educating not only me but our audience and I very much do value your perspectives on the topic of abortion, not only abortion, but reproductive justice. Can I say one last thing? Sure. Just because I, I, I got in the comments. Uh, no, don't worry. Um, the, the one thing I would say, I didn't want to get lost. We have this thought that, okay, well, let a woman see the whole um, array of choices that she has, whether it's abortion or contraception or to carry a pregnancy to term, which is a very vague term. I, in my opinion, it, it, from what I see, to be honest, just like we call violence against, against women, violence against women, violence against her own body, and to kill her unborn child. I think that's not a good choice to give women. I think it's very depressing. And um, uh, the idea that women are going, are choosing this because they're empowered is not true. And I think we should be careful with narratives because there are a lot of women who have boyfriends behind them who say, I don't want to pay child support. I already paid child support for one kid, I'm not paying oh. child support for this kid. Or I'm gonna kick you out of the house if you have this baby. Women who are in tough situations and there are men behind them who, per, who would want the abortion or there is an abusive parent, a sexually abusive parent who wants an abortion because then there's no evidence of the abuse. And so a lot of, there's an employment. Women are now men. We, we, men aren't pregnant, we aren't pregnant. And so not assuming that just because a woman is getting an abortion that she's not that she's doing it out of a sense of empowerment. Thank you. Wow. Okay, well, I'd like to thank all three of you for joining us here at Girls Empowered, for educating not only me, but our audience. And I very much do value your perspectives on the topic of abortion, not only abortion, but reproductive justice. Wow, this conversation definitely sparked both controversy and mutual agreement between all three parties. You really do learn something new every day. 
From all the research we have done to interviewing the organizations, I have definitely gained a better understanding of both the reproductive justice movement and abortion. Here at Girls Empowered, we wish to not only educate women, but act as their voice discussing topics that are often overlooked. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for our next episode.